I don't know if one has to do with another. But as I recall, about six or seven years ago, as the gent metal started to come to the forefront, a bunch of guitar companies started to put out some new guitars with things like the headless design, fan fret design, true temperament frets, all kinds of different things. Although those things existed before, I think they started to go, get popular right around that time. And today I show you two of my guitars that are headless. I put them head to head. Wait, they're headless, but head to head. Oh, the irony. Roll that intro. This is Gus G and you're watching Guitar Gear Guy. Thank you for tuning in. This is yours truly, Triple G, coming at you once again. I hope everybody is doing well. The day I'm recording this is a day after the Thanksgiving day in year 2020. If you are one of my five regular viewers, welcome back. And if you are new to this channel, why don't you please do me a favor, do me solid and hit that subscribe button and hit the bell notification so that I can come see you more often whenever I put out one of these videos. As always, this episode is brought to you by and sponsored by none other than yours truly, where I just talk about some of the gears that I own just be purely based on my perspective, just a normal, regular next door neighbor chump that really needs to practice more. The perspective that I'm trying to bring you is not the rock star guy or a guy with a store with the intention of uh, pumping some gear so that I could sell to you or some kind of a uh, social media influencer, the term that I hate a lot, uh, where I'm being sponsored by someone to show you something to be a corporate show. This isn't any of that. My whole thing is that I am relatable to you and that is the perspective I bring you. Again, if that's 
your sort of thing, do me solid and hit that subscribe button. Now, let's talk about the guitars. We'll start with my Strandberg Bowden OS6 guitar. So, this guitar has a swamp ash body and chamber and the guitar has a whole bunch of contours. So you have the uh, normal forearm cut. Then you have a pretty deep belly cut right here. And the heel joint is also shaved off as you go towards the neck to give you the um, ease of access right here at the upper register. And the guitar has basically the body shape that is very unique to Strandberg. Well, at the time anyways, when the first when it first came out. So the position of the guitar, you could uh, straddle it like you would normally. Then you have a position, this part right here that you can go on your right leg or the left leg, or you could straddle this guitar in between your two legs while you're sitting down. So it does give you a whole bunch of different position while you're sitting down. Not only from the chamber's body, but because of the headless design and a whole bunch of body missing. And if you can see this guitar, it's basically a lot smaller. The body is a lot smaller than your typical guitar. So the, the lightweightness of it is really great for eliminating the neck ache and the shoulder ache if you have it strapped on during a gig. All right, so Endure Neck is the patent design from Ola Strandberg, the, uh, the, br the brain trust behind this whole thing. So if you look at the back of this guitar's neck, it is not the typical round off kind of neck. It has very pronounced angular design. And as a Strandberg puts it, this Endure Neck supposedly relaxes muscles, joints, and, and tendons in your hands wrist and forearm as they stay also encouraging correct playing position promoting less hand injury so whether all that is how much of that is true or not i don't know but we'll get to that later on the five piece neck has a bird's eye maple board as well as the back and uh, bird's eye maple so three piece and then there's a roadwood fillet in the middle and then it is reinforced by two carbon fiber rods inside the neck and truss rod adjustment is right here at the top of the neck as I show you. The uh, 24 frets are stainless jumbo frets and the side dots are glow in the dark as well as the, the inlay markers right on the fretboard as well. As far as the hardware is concerned, everything is just black, murdered outlook, adds class, I like it. In terms of the pickups, you're dealing with the body, direct mounted, Seymour Duncan, Jazz, and JB combination, tried and true, cannot go wrong. All right, then compared to that, now what we're gonna look at is my Ormsby Goliath GTR. Again, headless, just as the Strandberg, but there's a bunch of different um, things here. So let's talk about let's talk about the specs of this guitar before we go into head-to-head -head comparison. This time we're dealing with a mahogany body, but it is also chamber that has the Makassar ebony veneer top. So as you can see here, uh, actually let me show you this way. So it looks beautiful. Lots of um, things happening right the top of the body for a beautiful grain and everything else you can see then the guitar has laminated rock maple it looks like a three-piece right here on the back um, neck that has a stainless steel frets 24 jumbo frets again with stainless steel wait did I already say the stainless steel frets but there you go if you held this guitar before the Strandberg, you wouldn't think twice about the neck. It has a very nice D-shaped neck, very inviting, very familiar, reasonable amount of a shoulder on the neck profile where you could definitely, there's enough to hold on to, but it doesn't feel like a very chunky thick neck. So uh, shredders alike, uh, you would find at home with this great neck. However, coming right out of the indoor neck, out of the Strandberg Oet Bowden, all of a sudden you feel this neck profile is like a basic bitch. It just, uh, 
just a normal guitar neck while it's a spectacular neck right after you're dealing with all that uh, angles and the straight uh, flat surface of the neck of the boat and all of a sudden it's just kind of you could also say that you're you came back home i guess um feels definitely comfortable but it definitely huge difference just as the bone it has the side dot markers that's uh, lumen lay so if you're performing on a dark stage you'll be able to find your way home easily something i don't need to worry about since i'm never on a stage as far as the pickups are concerned your bridge pickup is custom in-house wound nunchucker a8 pickup whereas the bridge uh, the neck pickup is uh, a2 again custom wound in-house de la cream the knobs have a rubber grip uh, which is very assuring when you need to operate whilst in the middle of playing and you have a push pull for coil split so when you're looking at these two guitars it is very evident the makers had one thing clearly in their mind which is these are for gigging musicians on the stage one they're both extremely lightweight. The Bowden weighs in uh, hair under five pounds, very light, um, at, just as with the Goliath GTR. Now, the Goliath has a slightly bigger body than Bowden, but it still has the butt of the guitar. You know, chunk of it has been cut to reduce weight. Um, again, also the headless design eliminates the headstock, again, shedding some weight, chambered body. So all of that makes the, both the guitars extremely lightweight, as well as the Luminlay side dot markers and glow in the dark inlay markers, as well as the side dots on this. Again, you could find your way easily on a dark stage. So if you're a gigging performing musician on a dark stage, great stuff. As far as the neck profile is concerned, I uh, talked a little bit about the Goliath the GTR neck earlier as I was showing you the specs of that particular guitar where it's a traditional somewhat D, thin D shape with a little bit of a shoulder on there. But the topic here for the bone is this Endure neck which has a pronounced angles and flat gripping surface like I'm showing you right now. It definitely feels foreign and weird the first couple of minutes you're sitting down playing this neck. However, I, I don't know about others, but like myself, I mean, I found pretty comfortable a couple minutes after started to mess around with this neck. And dare I say, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say it is better or worse or more comfortable or more awkward compared to other necks. However, it is definitely unique, one of a kind, and their claim of, you know, making it more comfortable, less uh, fatigue, less possibility of, you know, injury to your wrist and forearm and promoting the correct hand position. I could see it. I'm not saying that is what I agree with, but I could definitely see how your thumb rests in certain spot. Like when you're cording, like when you're cording right here, your thumb is in the proper position with up against a flat neck surface where you are providing enough counter action. And also if you're down here on the upper register, your thumb is directly on top of this uh, top third of the flat neck profile where it is providing ton of uh, support as you are shredding it up up here. So the Endure neck, though it looks weird, I actually like it a lot. So both of these guitars are uh, country of origin, made in Korea. The Goliath here is made in World Music Factory, which last dozen years or so uh, made a name for themselves, making really high quality OEM or uh, import lines for who's who of guitar makers, mainly PRSSE line of guitars. So the quality on the fit and finish and build quality on Goliath, absolutely epic, nothing to fault. Same goes for this uh, Strandberg Bowden, where it's also made in Korea. I don't know what you know a factory this is made out of, but 
If you look at the way this thing is built, way this thing is made, it is absolutely ridiculously well put together. To a point where, again, you know, country of origin shouldn't really matter in year 2020. The quality is going to be pretty decent so long as the parent company does great quality control and quality assurance and the factory that are producing them happen to be one of the higher end OEM factories then really shouldn't matter. And these two are living proof examples of you know, thin line between the Far Eastern imports versus something like a US built guitar or in this case, Australian custom shop and in this case, a Switzerland custom shop. So they uh, made these models to, you know, meet more more of the appeal to the mass, right? Because um, you're not, not everybody could get the custom shop version of these things like the Sarah Longfields of the world or the Tosin Abbasis of the world or Misha Mansours of the world, whatever it may be. So these are much more um, affordable, something that you and I can get. However, quality really, you're re literally getting 98.5% of a something custom shop that costs five times more than what these guys cost. So what is the deal at the end of the day with these headless guitars? So way I look at it is this, the headless gives you weight saving because you whacked off the headstock. Then because there is no headstock that is at an angle like so, like a traditional necks, unless you're dealing with the fender necks. So, um, you could lay the guitar flat on the surface, whether that's a uh, you know, your carpeted floor or your desk or wherever it may be, no issues there. Also not having that extra length right here means that you could be slightly less careful and you have liberty of uh, movement as you are less prone to knocking the headstock on something, possibly breaking it like, SGs, which have uh, traditionally very notorious for uh, having a weak headstock. Also, both of these guitars share another common thing set aside from the headless design. They also share another feature, which is the fan fret design. So now this Goliath here has a more pronounced fan fret than my Bowden. I don't know if uh, camera is gonna show well here, but if you can see right out of the uh, first fret, second fret, third fret, the angle of the fan, the frets are right out of the gate, they start extreme right on Goliath, whereas the bone starts off with somewhat regular angle and then it starts to um, go off, whereas this thing, it's at an extreme angle right out of the first fret. So this gives you, the fan frets gives you ability to have longer strings on the lower register notes where you could have that thud, that uh, rumbling low end, whilst maintaining the typical scale length right here at the uh, higher strings where you still have the sharp, um, crisp, ringing note. So it gives you best of both world, which is why I think it has caught on between um, the shredders and all the prog guys and us as guitar fans, we typically pine for something vintage, right? The 59 Les Pauls and 63 Fenders and the list goes on and on and on. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that all the classic songs that we grew up listening to were recorded and played on those guitars by our guitar heroes of that yesteryear. So we all some kind of gravitate towards those vintage design and vintage gears, but Fast forward to modern day, you have guys like Tosin and Misha, that is trailblazing. Now the new guitar heroes of this generation, the younger kids listen to. So fast forward another 50 years from today, maybe these innovative designs and features would be something that would be looked at with higher, higher regards at uh, when that time comes. 
Perhaps these not so regular looking guitars give insight to where the whole industry is heading to. A lot of um, typical guitar companies, you know, Fenders and Gibsons, they have obligations to meet the demands of their old fans, uh, traditionalists, by producing, continue to produce all the models that we're all accustomed to. But something like innovation as you know these what these guitars represent are to me welcome change um it is breathing fresh breath into the whole industry and a lot better than just throwing some new paint color on tried and true old boring i, I say boring but i don't mean it that way just something very predictable where you know these things right out of the gate you could tell Right out of the gate, you have new design and new features that either enhance your playing or stability of the instrument or ability to keep tuning or better intonation and flexibility. All those things come into play in modern guitar designing. Innovations are something this industry needs and I think uh, these two models perhaps demonstrate kind of a meeting in the middle, something old and something new, not really upsetting the traditionalists, but meeting the demanding requirements of the newer generation. And I think uh, these two really are built well, designed well, and something that really deserve your time. What do you think? Do these uh, turn you off or do these uh, things, uh, do these seem interesting to you? I'm interested to hear your thoughts. So share uh, your comments below in the comment section. I'd love to hear what you think. All right, well, that's it for this episode. I've been Triple G. You've been awesome. Until next time, you guys all take care. And Triple G, out.